Hey, I am Michael. I'm an entrepreneur, small business owner, trying to be an actor, a whole bunch of other random stuff that I'm not so good at, and I'm very, very neurotic. I'm also a TV host and your host for what we call the Second Scene Podcast. It is a Dweebs Global production where you can go for free mentorship help. Anything from mental health to resume writing, there's somebody there to help you. They have mentors around the world. That's why we do this podcast. It is for dweebsglobal.org. So I'm here today with Wade Simmons, and I'm going to keep his intro very simple. He had, he has a degree in filmmaking and a degree in mortuary science. So welcome, Wade. How you doing? Hey. What's up, Wade? <laughs> what's up? What's up? Just, you have a job as a, working in mortuaries, which is very odd. There's not many people that work in mortuaries. So what what brought you to that field? Uh, well, when I was a, a little kid, I always said that I, I wanted to be a mortician. Um, maybe it was, you know, going, going to church or whatever, and, you know, going to a lot of funerals and stuff, but it never really creeped me out or nothing. It's just like, it seemed like an interesting job. So, you know, like when I used to say that I wanted to do that, everybody was kind of like, uh, you know, what about like, maybe like a firefighter or, you know, a, a photographer or something, but I'm like, you know, I, I like photography and filmmaking, but, you know, it was in my heart to do it. So, you know, I, I just pursued it. And then I started I know, but- uh, working. I started working at a funeral home in high school and I, I've been there ever since. Like, how does somebody want to do that? Like, what aspect of it drew you in? Like, what aspect of working in a mortuary do you like? Uh, Well, I think I think for the most part, like, it's one of those jobs where, like, you get to help people. Uh, you get to kind of help people in their time of need. And then, too, like, mm-hmm. it's one of those jobs that, like, will teach you not to take life for granted. Like, I think for me, it's more so, like, the lesson that you learn from it. Like, because, like, you know, people come to you at, at different times. Sometimes it's expected, sometimes unexpected. But, like, I don't know. Like, it just to teach you, like, it teaches you to, like, really appreciate life. Yeah. Is that, did you know that that's what it was going to be about before you got into it? Like, how'd you know? Uh, yeah, like what, but what, it's like... What attracted you to it to begin with? It's like, I think I think it was so much that, like, you know, like, working there kind of, like, motivates me, like, to, like, you know, go after the things that I want in life. Like, it's a constant reminder, like, you know, you got to make the most of time, like, you know. And I think for me, I think that's one of the things that, like, uh, keeps me doing that type of job because, like, even when you're not working or something, then you might be having a bad day. And then you come to work and like you kind of look like, man, maybe things are not like I want them. But, you know, it kind of like teach you to be more intentional with life, you know, kind of like it just motivates you like to like, you know, don't worry about the setbacks. Like always kind of look at things to get you to where you want to be and to like not drag your feet with it. I think that's really what kind of keeps me doing that type of work. Got you. That no, that makes a lot of sense. It makes you really, you know, makes you realize things can be taken away from you at you know a moment's notice. So yeah, um, yeah. I think I would just dwell on that all the time. I think having that is like the forefront of my life. I don't know. I might. I don't. I. I. I, I always imagine people working at mortuaries as, as depressed, but you're so no. far from it. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's like no, like you really, you 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 really like you know like when you leave work like because like a couple of times i would go to wrestling practice and i'd be in there smiling and everybody like well what you left and i'm like man i just left the funeral home man i'm just i'm just happy to be here you know <laughs> that's wild that's wild so what is what is your job at the at the at the mortuary what do you what do you do what's your typical day so my typical day is like a lot of times uh because like right now i work monday evenings and then i work friday saturday Sunday pretty much all day so like I have three off days but when I'm there um for the most part like you know I come in you know whatever's need to be done we help set up chapels I mean we clean chapels if we have to uh I answer phone calls here and there you know I'm I can't do too much talking on the phone because of my voice because I have like a weird vocal condition like if if I get like really tense or whatever my voice tends to strain Oh, well. So I kind of try to stay away from that aspect, but you know, but since I finally passed the test, I'm looking probably to do more like embalming and removals or something. Yeah. Okay. So what, I'm sorry. What is this test? What's the? 
So to be a funeral director is crazy, but like you have to go to school, which I did go, and then you have to pass the funeral director side of the test and you have to pass the science part. So the funeral director side is more like, you know, sitting with the families, making arrangements, uh, doing removals, going to the cemeteries, doing services, handling death certificates and stuff like that. The science part pretty much deals with like cremation and embalming. And, you know, some states, you can do, you can like have one license, but in Illinois, where I live, you got to do both, which is not a bad thing. But yeah, like I, I didn't, I didn't think years ago that I would probably like embalming, but I'm kind of like now, like, uh, I think it'd be nice to kind of do something more behind the scenes. Cause I, I mean, I've been kind of working in the front so long, like I want to try working behind the scenes now, you know? Right. But that's embalming's working directly with the, with the bodies that's uh yeah that then that you have no problem with that that's you're no, used to seeing dead bodies all the time yeah but i mean my thing is like when you're in bombing you want to be good at it like you don't just want to uh like you know take that job lightly because like when you're doing that you want to make sure you get the appearance right i mean you want to make sure you're using the right chemicals the right fluid you want to make sure you're getting the features right because the worst thing you can do is have somebody like looking like somebody totally different and then the family's like uh because like to be honest like because like a lot of people are getting away from traditional funerals a little bit and you know and somebody once told me reason why like they're like well you know when my cousin passed you know he like you know i don't think he really looked like himself but i think like you know like when you do that type of work you got to be honest with people and you got to be honest with the family like let them know what you can and can't do and you know and and when you do that i think that people would appreciate it a little more but at least try you know you try to do the best that you can i got you so okay so when somebody passes away their body i guess because the gas is inside they swell up correct sometimes is that what happens yeah. what's the sometimes. okay but not always well, well not a, well you know what the, th- the thing is because you got to look at it like your blood is what keeps your color like if somebody just laying flat like that of course you know, you may get a lot of blood flow up here. It might, you know, kind of change shapes a little bit. But, I mean, if you were a good embalmer, what you would do, I mean, you would go in there, you would, you would, of course, wash the body, set the features. You would start the embalming process and everything. But also along the way, like, you would make sure that if somebody swelled up too much, like, you would try to bring some of that swelling down, you know. Yeah. Okay, and what is that process? How do you bring swelling down? Well, you could you could do it by like aspirating the body. Uh, you know, you would take an instrument called a trocar, and then it, you know you can go up and down with it. And it's it's almost kind of like a like a vacuum, uh, a, a sharp vacuum that just you know. Wow. But again, to to be a good embalmer, like you have to really care about what you're doing. Like you just don't you know do it careless. Like you take your time and make sure that you do the best job that you can with that person. All right. So what else goes into the process of embalming? I mean, oh, it's, I mean, it's a lot. I mean, because you got to look at it like if you are doing somebody that had an autopsy, you might have to like really do a little bit more because, of course, you have to suture the body back together. But you have to do like more sectional embalming because like, you know, because um, like really embalming is just making an incision, carotid artery. Uh, some people do it through the femorals, which, you know, near the leg area or whatever. But I mean, that's like. A basic embalming but if you got like an autopsy case then you would have to do more sectional embalming and that takes a little bit longer yeah so you're replacing their blood with with another with with an embalming fluid essentially is that what's yep, going so on when, so when you pump the fluid in the blood comes out yep okay and then uh, how do you what other care can you take to make them look more like they looked when they were alive well i think the first thing is really I would say it would be nice for the embalmer to have a picture of the person. Mm-hmm. I mean, because most people would give the picture to like the makeup artists and stuff like that. But to me, I would say you give it to the embalmer because like when you're embalming before the tissues start to fix, you want to try to get those features as right as possible because you can always uh, apply makeup or whatever. But I mean, but if you if if somebody's face is blown up too much, all the makeup in the world is not going to make. You know what I'm saying? Like it's, right. it's kind of like 
it's kind of like the filmmaker that says we'll fix it in post. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know it's, it's like, no, you got you want to get it right before you get there. Then it looks a lot better. So you have a certain amount of time that you can do this in. And if you just if, it, if too much time goes by, then you, it's, it's much harder to do these things. Yep. Okay. Because once you put that, that fluid in and the tissue fixate in, it's like, it's not really too much you can do once it's stuck like that. Okay, so the embalming fluid is almost, it it, it, it it stiffens you. Yep. After a while, yeah. Yep. Okay. But you don't, you don't handle the makeup though. Somebody comes in and does the makeup afterwards. Is that? Uh, well, we, well, makeup is a part of it too. Uh, I mean, but some people are better at it than others. Uh, me personally, I don't really like to mess with make. I mean, I'm a guy, so I don't, <laughs> that's not, that's not like, uh-huh. I mean, don't, 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 don't get me wrong. Like it, it's some brothers good at it too, but like, I. Uh, that that's not that's not my area of expertise. I mean, just yet. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So uh, you know, these are all the things I don't. You know, people don't think about that goes into the funeral and uh, just the emotional aspect of the funeral too. You have such a big responsibility there. Yeah, I mean, and, and that's why I say that I really believe that it, if an embalmer, if they can't have a picture of the person, I think that helps because you got to look at it the way you close somebody's mouth or. The way you do the eyes, all those things, because all of our appearance is different, but we all have something about our appearance that make it us. You know, right. but if you go in there and you see somebody's mouth is a little wider than it used to be, that throws the appearance off. Right. You know, if if the eyes are shut a certain way and the shape is looking off, then, you know, that throws the whole appearance off. Right. I mean, family members and close friends are going to notice those things pretty quickly, too. Yep. It's going to be pretty That's obvious. True, yep. Yeah. So that so that's why you don't you don't even want to shave anybody without asking the family because I mean because you know um sometimes people have beards and stuff the way they wear their hair and if that's the way their family wanted to remember them then you would let them tell you. Uh, right. Yeah, shave them or don't shave them because I mean you can always if you take it off you can put it back on but it just won't look as natural, you know. So you want to you don't want to you don't want to overdo it. You let the family direct you on everything that they want. Got you. So you get a lot of requests from families. What are some What are some odd requests you've gotten over the years? Oh man, uh, some of them. Some of them I probably can't really repeat, but, <laughs> but uh, we, can, we can always edit out. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, but I mean, I, I can tell you about a time where like, um, well, let me see what was the oddest request. Oh yeah, that was. What, what was that one? I think one family said something about can we cut the hand off or something like that. I was like, oh no, we can't do that. <laughs> they just wanted a head on a pedestal or something. They just wanted. <laughs> they wanted a hand. Oh, the hand. The yeah, hand. Yeah, like no, I don't, yeah, no, we don't want to do that. <laughs> I don't know. It's just yeah. <laughs> I think that was probably the weirdest one. <laughs> do they ever ask for the bodies to be in certain positions or? Yep. Yeah, they actually, there was a guy, what was that, Monday night I was working, and he was a mason, so they wanted his hands, like, a certain way, um, and, you know, um, you know, but, I mean, again, you know, you kind of you kind of let them dictate to you what they want, because it's their loved one, and, and you want to give them the best memory as possible. Right, right. What about, what about bodies you get that nobody claims? How do you treat those? Uh, well, that's an interesting question too because when I was in school, we actually we embalmed bodies that were not claimed. And and to be honest, it was it was really kind of sad because like at the funeral home, normally you wouldn't get an unclaimed body. That body would more look like so go to like the medical examiner, and then what would probably happen is that if nobody don't claim it, it would probably you know. Uh, be cremated or took into like a, a mass burial but in the meantime like students like when i was a student in mortuary school the the bodies we embalmed those were unclaimed bodies oh wow wow i wonder how, it, how many unclaimed bodies there are a day i wonder what that man, number possibly a, is it's it's a lot of them and the thing that kind of makes me wonder is like you mean to tell me like i know somebody got families but I think that's why it's important, like, to check on people and check on your families and stuff. Because, like, you know, when you would go in there, you would see people, like, you know, you don't know if they had kids, you don't know if they had siblings, you don't know if, you know, you just don't really know, you know. Right, right. I mean, they I have wonder- names, they have name tags and everything, but it's just for whatever reason, families don't 
don't always come get them. Got you. Got you. You have have anyone that people just hated and they they still wanted them embalmed just so that they could. Uh, well, you know, the, <laughs> now I remember this one time. This was years ago. Uh, this guy, he must have been married a few times because uh, the lady came in and said, uh, that's my ex-husband and he looks better dead. And I mean, I was just like, oh, my God. Like, I mean, you know, regardless of how he was, I'm like, you know, I, I don't think that was a pretty nice thing to say. But, you know, that's how she felt, I guess. Wow. Yeah. Well, uh, things just come out of people's mouths sometimes. It's uh, I, mean, I, mean, you, back. You, I mean, you you've seen, uh, you know, working there, you see you see a lot of stuff like unbelievable. Like, you know, you. you I don't seen it all, pretty much. <laughs> I mean, what's, what's one of the fight. craziest experiences you've had there? What's one of the craziest things you can think of that's that's happened? Well, well we had a repass like a couple of years ago, and a repass is kind of like a luncheon that you know they would have after or before the funeral. <laughs> and there were two family members, you know, literally they were in the wintertime, took their shirt off, and they they were fighting in the parking lot over some chicken, over some chicken, the, like. Over some chicken, they were fighting in the parking lot while their <laughs> their dead relative was inside. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I'm like, maybe I'd go over there and get a piece if it was that good or something. I don't know. <laughs> 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 but over some chicken. Oh man. Uh, well, emotions were brewing. You know, it was an emotional time. So I guess. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm, chicken, I'm pretty sure it was. It, 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 it was probably chicken. a little. It, it might have been a little more to it than just the chicken, but I, I guess the chicken was enough to take it a little further, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow, wow! So I mean, you so you're really there for the families. I mean, you it's an it's it's got to take an emotional toll. It's got to be hard sometimes. Uh, just yeah. uh, having to comfort them and what to say and how to handle them, and you know, people want to hear different well, things. And, well, you know what I think about that to me. I'll tell you from somebody that working in the business, what I've learned that helps is everything that you do in that business. You got to be genuine in it. Like, um, don't say what you don't really mean. I mean, get to know the families and, you know, because sometimes, sometimes you don't really have words you can say, you know, um, sometimes it's just, to me, I would say anybody that's in that field, you have to be genuine with it because people, because people can tell when it's not genuine. You know what I'm saying? Right. Right. And, and my right. thing got- is that it, it is a business, but you still have to have compassion and, and be genuine with people. Right. No, I understand. Uh, it's totally different, but in the way similar, you know, I, I own a couple pawn shops. So people okay. come and they need money. They need to borrow $100. And uh, yeah. they're at like some of the lowest times in their lives, you know, and this is like, you know, we write a couple hundred loans a day. But that person yeah. in my store, it is the most important moment in their lives is to get this hundred dollars to go buy diapers or food on the table. And, you know, you got to you got to be there for them and you got to genuinely be there for them. Otherwise, it just doesn't come out right. And, you know, they're going to leave with a horrible experience. And, um, yeah. yeah, it's not the same. So. Now, that, now, that's awesome. Now, I've, ne- I've never heard of a pawn shop that did that. That's pretty awesome. Oh, a lot of us do. We take it very serious. You know, we're here, we're helping people out all day long. So it's, uh, you know, it's all about customer service. It's all about being there for the people that are coming yeah. in. So, you know, we're part of the community like that. Um, That's good. People are in a lot more emotional states when they come to see you. But, uh, you know, people are coming in here, though. They need money for their cancer treatments or their their kids' yeah. cancer treatments and stuff. So it's, uh, yeah. you know, we get the pretty emotional emotional ones as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it's hard. It's it's. I kind of understand where it's hard, but it's also a feel good. It can be feel good, even yeah. though it's such a. We're dealing with such horrible situations, just because you know you're. True. You yeah, can still I mean, give people a smile, and you can still give them some joy in. Yeah. The most terrible. You know situation. It, it kind of re- reminds me. Of, I remember. Do uh, you remember uh, that show? Everybody hates Chris with Chris Rock. There was an episode where he, where he worked at Mr. Omar's funeral home and he was supposed to go to a concert. And like right when he was leaving out to go to the concert, a, a lady came to the funeral home because I think like her husband died. And then he ended up missing the concert, but he ended up comforting the lady. So like, you know, like I love the episode because like it was really like relatable because like uh, there are some moments like even like Sunday, like when I was at the funeral home and it was nobody else there. And a, and a lady walked in and she um 
she started telling me about her mother and stuff like that. And then we got to talking about life and just, it was a really nice conversation. And it's like, you know, I feel like when you do that kind of work, like, you know, you realize you really do get to help people. And, you know, there are some moments you, you can really appreciate, you know, you know, accepting that job. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I, I'm so glad there are people like you out there that are willing to do that, happy to do it. And, um, yeah, and seem to be handling it well. So there's, there's, I don't think there's a lot of people out there like you that are looking forward to going to the mortuary daily. Oh, so. uh, yeah. Well, you know, like, you, you know, it just teaches you don't sweat the small stuff. Like, you know, you, you always keep a really nice attitude. Oh, uh, that's, that's amazing. So you, you're also a filmmaker. Um, yeah. and this is something, this is something you're passionate about and you're doing a lot. I love uh, it. You're, you're always working on. So you've created some short films. Yep. Yeah, I've, I've been doing that for about five years now. And uh, and to be honest, when I went to film school, I went to film school like like literally seven months after finish, after finishing mortuary school. So as soon as I went to film school, by the time I graduated, I had already produced like 14 shorts. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> you know, because like, cause, cause like when, I, cause when I went to film school, I'm like, you know, I, I'm not going to wait to like, till I get out of school to like, you know, make stuff. Like now that I'm here, I'm going to take advantage and make everything I can while I'm here. And I mean, that's what I did. <laughs> yeah, I think you could, you could have some pretty unique short films just based on your experience at the mortuary. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you really I, yeah. have a different perspective uh, than a lot of people have. So, yeah. Well, you know, like most of my films are about like love. Like I'm, I'm really big on like, uh, love like not always just romantically but i mean just love for people in general because i mean that that don't mean that like we don't get angry or upset but i feel like when you look at the world and the way things are now i feel like it's just like it's not everybody but it's a very big lack of love like because you always hear all these people talk about like let's make the world a better place and all this but i just feel like it's in our hands to do that because if we really loved our brothers and sisters we would help each other you know, we wouldn't look down on one another like it. We have the power to do this, but it's just, you know, everybody has a choice. So, like, you know, I like like promoting love. Like, I'm really big on that. That's great. Uh, there's way too much selfishness in, in this world. Uh, and we definitely yeah. need more love. So, uh, yeah, I, I like that. Do you write? Do you write and direct and film your own stuff? Yep. Now, I, I didn't start out like that because, like, when I started my web series, originally I had somebody else directing. I had somebody else acting as my role, but what happened was somebody didn't show up. So, uh, so I had to pay everybody to be there anyway. So I was like, well, so, so I went ahead and did the part and then I just kept doing it. And then from then on, like, um, I would pay like classmates to help me out and write, but then everybody kind of got busy doing their own thing. So I'm like, you know, um, because like when I would pay somebody to write a script for me, I would have to wait like two or three weeks to get it. So when I started writing for myself, I was done maybe in 15, 20 minutes because like, like, like me, I love writing. And me, like a lot of times, like I come up with stories really quick. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like it takes time to develop and everything. But I because like I remember being in elementary school, right? And we had these drills we would do uh, with math. They they used to call them holy cards. Well, like, they would give us a sheet of paper with holes in them. And we would have to put down, like, like they had addition and subtraction. So we would have to answer as many as we could. So, like, we're writing, right? I have, like, I do drills. Like, I come up with stories real quick. And I see how fast I can come up with one and what can I do with it. So, like, I started writing for myself because, I mean, I was able to get stuff done a little faster that way. Yeah. Okay. Wow, well, I, uh, I, we will definitely put links below the podcasts uh, to your work so that people can check it out. Oh, man, so, that sounds great. Of course. I, I want to ask you about your, you, you had mentioned that you have a vocal cord um, problem. Yeah. What is that? Uh, so I have a, 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 a weird, I call it a weird disorder. It's called a spasmatic dysphonia. And it's a, it's not life threatening, but what it is is like, if I'm happy, like really excited, my voice is normal. But if I get like tensed up or or stressed, my voice strains a little bit. And I mean, you know, it's not life threatening or anything, but it's just a 
like a disorder where you have to kind of manage your stress level a little bit. So like I, I can live with it because like, um, you're a happy guy. It's, 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 it's causing me to make some, some very different life adjustments, but you know, I, I'm glad that it was something mild that kind of got me to, you know, realize I need to slow down a little bit, you know, <laughs> just a what? little bit. Interesting. Is there any treatments for it? Is, are, are you on any treatments for it or? Uh, well, I, I I I was taking like voice therapy, but but they do have like these temporary uh, Botox injections. But <clears throat> I don't really want to get those because like it'll weaken my vocal cord. Oh uh, well. Know? So I feel well, I like I I, I, I want to try a little more like holistic type of healing, you know. Yeah, that's the way to go. That's definitely the way the way yeah. you should do. Just get. I guess the Botox would numb them, so you wouldn't know that you're straining them. Yeah, it it would it would numb it, but then it's like it will cause side effects later. So you know, it, it, if it's gonna make it worse, I don't want it. <laughs> God, it makes sense. And, makes sense. And so then, I think you're taking and a smart being approach. A, and then being a guy that work in the funeral business, you know, I do have a little bit of medical background too. So like, <clears throat> I, you try to you try to do things as naturally as possible <laughs> if you want to keep yourself <laughs> a little longer. You know. <laughs> Got you. Have you learned the the secret to longevity, having seen so many uh, people pass? Yeah, I mean, you know, because I mean, I, I've I've known people that even live to be a hundred years old, and I know one lady lived to be hundred. She ate fried chicken all her life, you know. So, <laughs> but, but I mean, but I mean, it's just it's it's, it's really just all in how you take care of yourself, you know. Right, right, right. Unhappy and close close family and friends is what they're kind of showing is the key to longevity. Yeah. I think. Yeah. yeah, and I and, and I mean I I'm also a man of faith, so like I I pray and talk to God a lot too, you know. But I mean, you you got it. One thing that I think that people have to realize, no matter how young or old you are, you have to take care of yourself. And I mean, even you know, it's not all just eating and stuff like that. You everybody got to manage their stress level because like, you know, if you don't, you can cause yourself to get sick. Yeah. yeah, well, I'm. I have. I have a lot of trouble managing my stress level. So <laughs> yeah, uh, you gotta that. <laughs> that is my big yeah. weakness. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 easy. It's easier said than done. But I'm learning that a lot of sickness is is triggered by stress. Yeah, yeah. No, you are. You are completely right. Well, thank you. This was super interesting. I really appreciate you coming on. I really right. enjoyed talking to you. Hey, thank you.